At this time, we are going through the details about Linux commands for beginners. One of the important aspects for beginners is to understand the relevance of SSH. Uh, already we have gone through the details about SSH after provisioning the EC2 instance from AWS. As part of this sectional model, we'll actually get an overview of SSH to interact with remote servers. First, we'll create multiple AWS EC2 instances so that we understand relevance of some of the important aspects associated with SSH. Then we'll actually go through the details about different modes of SSH login to remote servers. We have passwordless login and also password login. By default, uh, when it comes to EC2 instances, we'll have only passwordless login. We'll understand how to take care of logging in into the remote servers using passwordless login. Then we'll actually get into the details related to SSH demos on remote servers and also we'll actually review the properties files and also properties. Once we understand the relevance of demos and properties files as well as properties associated with SSH, we'll enable password login by updating the properties file then we'll validate whether we are able to log in into the remote servers using password login. Then we'll also go through the details about running commands on remote servers using SSH. And finally, we'll terminate the AWS EC2 instances which we have provisioned at the beginning of this sectional module. That being said, by the end of the sectional module, you will be comfortable with SSH and also your productivity with respect to using SSH uh, working with remote servers will improve a bit. Make sure you understand all the important aspects related to SSH so that you can put them in practice on day-to-day -day usage. As part of this sectional model, we are in the process of getting value of SSH to interact with remote servers. I would like to have at least two EC2 instances to explore all the key concepts related to SSH. Uh, to create two EC2 instances, you can go to the AWS EC2 console, then click on launch instance. Click on launch instance. I'll be creating instances of type Ubuntu 20.04, which means both the instances will have Ubuntu 20.04 operating system. Let's say GS demo or getting started demo. Let's choose Ubuntu here. Make sure we select Ubuntu 20.04 operating system. When it comes to instance type, we can use t2.micro. When it comes to key pair, it is nothing but JS demo. For network, you can leave this. You don't need to add anything else. Then when it comes to storage, I'll be using 12 GB storage. If you look at this message, it says free tier eligible customers can get up to 30 GB of EBS general purpose or magnetic storage. In this case, we are saying 12 GB. As we are trying to create two instances, we'll be using 24 GB storage. If you use 16 GB or 18 GB, it will end up in the range of 32 GB to 36 GB. Then you have to pay for that extra storage. In this case, just to avoid additional costs, I am just using 12 GB here. Make sure the overall storage doesn't cross 30 GB. Also make sure you terminate the earlier instance which you have created as part of getting started. Now you can increase the number of instances to 2 here. You can review the details. We are trying to create two instances with Ubuntu 20.04 operating system. The server type is nothing but t2.micro which is free tier eligible. I am actually creating new security group. You can also use the existing security group. Then when it comes to the storage volume, for each instance we are actually configuring 12 GB storage. Now you should be able to click on launch instance. It will take care of creating both the instances for us. Let's wait and see the details here. You can see there are two links here. These two links are related to two instances. As we have seen earlier, you should be able to launch Cloud Shell. Let's launch Cloud Shell here. Then you should be able to get details about these two instances by using instance ID, using describe instances command. Now let me actually go to the AWS Cloud Shell. It is still coming up. Let's wait until it comes up. Then we'll take it further. Also, as we have created these EC2 instances using uh, GS demo key pair, Leveraging the PEM file that is downloaded when we created that key pair, we should be able to connect to these EC2 instances without any issues. However, we need to get the public IPv4 DNS information to connect to those instances using that PEM file. Still, Cloud Shell is coming up. Let's wait until it comes up. Then we will take it further. Now you can see that Cloud Shell is started. We should be able to copy this uh, ID. This is nothing but instance ID. Now you can say AWS EC2 describe instances then hyphen hyphen instance ids you can specify both the instance ids uh, comma separated like this let me give this instance id as well there's a closing bracket at the end i need to make sure it is removed let me remove the closing bracket now let me hit enter 
okay the syntax is not like this probably i might have to use spaces yeah with the spaces it is working this is related to the first instance which is nothing but this one you can see here now this is related to the second instance you can see a different instance id here this is how you should be able to get the details of these instances using uh, cli as part of the cloud shell that being said you can also connect to these instances via ssh by uh, getting the appropriate public ipv4 dns for these instances you can select this and then you should be able to click on this to copy public ipv4 dns into buffer then you should be able to go to the terminal then say ssh hyphen i tilde slash downloads that is the location where i have the pem file then gsdemo.pem then ubuntu is the operating system at the rate paste the public ip4 dns now you can see that it is trying to connect to the ec2 instance now it is connected to the ec2 instance this is the first one let's get the second one as well the second one uh, is nothing but uh, this one now we should be able to select this click on this to copy the public ip before dns we should be able to go here then say ssh hyphen i tilde slash downloads then gsdemo.pem then ubuntu at the rate paste the public ip before dns hit enter say yes now you are connected to the second instance as well this is how you should be able to create multiple instances and also validate whether you are able to connect to them or not make sure you create at least two to actually go through all the details related to ssh which will be covered as part of this sectional module also you can come out of this virtual machine by saying exit as part of this sectional module we are going through details related to oreo of ssh to interact with remote servers already we have created two ec2 instances and also we have validated by using ssh we are using a mode called as passwordless login in this case we are not prompted for any password you can hit enter you can see that i am able to connect to one of the ec2 instances without entering any password this is called as passwordless login now if i exit from here and then if i remove the pem file it will prompt for the password now let's try running this command without uh, reference to the pem file let's see what happens it is complaining permission denied it is not prompting for the password there is a reason why it is not prompting for the password and directly saying permission denied because as part of the server the password login is disabled password login is the least secure way of logging in into the remote servers by default as part of the ec2 instances in aws password lo login is disabled only passwordless login is enabled that is why it is very important for us to have the key pair while creating ec2 instances in aws without key pair if you try to create ec2 instance you can create but you will not be able to log in directly uh, there will be issues logging in into those ec2 instances if you wanted to log in into those ec2 instances it is mandatory to actually use key pair and also you need to make sure the pem file is downloaded for that key pair that is being used while creating the ec2 instances that being said the two modes that are available with respect to ssh are nothing but password login and passwordless login by default all the ec2 instances come with passwordless login how to confirm whether password login is enabled or disabled for that we have to review the ssh properties we'll go through those details as part of subsequent lectures in this sectional module as part of this sectional module we are going through details related to oreo of ssh to interact with remote servers so far we have created multiple aws ec2 instances and also we have gone through the details related to different modes of ssh login to remote servers now it is important for us to understand passwordless login to remote server already i have covered these details as part of getting started with aws i'll be reiterating the same here for that i'll be using the lucid diagram which i have created earlier this lucid diagram only represents one virtual machine as of now we have two virtual machines with js demo as part of the name and hence we can actually update this diagram like this now we have two virtual machines we can separate these things as js demo 1 and js demo 2 also keep in mind that we have used js demo key pair while creating these virtual machines we already have the pem file downloaded onto our pc as part of the authorized keys in these virtual machines the public key part of js demo will be added as authorized keys contain the public key we'll be able to connect to these virtual machines using js demo private key instead of js demo private key if you try to use any other private key it will not work now let me go back here 
I also have additional uh, private keys on my machine. You can see that I have attempted to connect to this uh, virtual machine or EC2 instance using itvdemo.pem under .sh. Earlier I have used the one which is gsdemo.pem under downloads and I am able to connect but when I try to connect to the same virtual machine or EC2 instance using the same user but different pem file it is saying permission denied because the public key that is there as part of the authorized keys is not uh, relevant to this private key. The private key and public key should be compatible. Both should belong to same key pair. That is why with gsdemo.pem it is working whereas with the itvdemo.pem it is not working. Also when we try to connect to these virtual machines without uh, passing the pem file it is not attempting to connect to uh, those EC2 instances with password because password login is disabled. Only passwordless login is enabled. When we use passwordless login, we have to pass appropriate uh, private key files. If not, the login will not be succeeding. Uh, make sure you understand these concepts and make sure you use appropriate private key file to connect to the EC2 instances without any gaps. Even though I am demonstrating using EC2 instances, these concepts are applicable with any remote servers, not just EC2 instances. However, the PEM file names might be represented in a different way. Instead of saying PEM file, they might say private key file or something else. That being said, as we have understood the process of uh, passwordless login to remote server, now it is time for us to get an overview of SH daemons and configuration files. Those details will be covered as part of the next lecture. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details related to ORU of SSH to interact with remote servers. So far, we have created multiple AWS EC2 instances and also we have understood different modes of SSH login. Then we have actually gone through the details about understanding passwordless login to remote servers. All this being demonstrated using AWS, but you should be able to provision virtual machines from other cloud platforms or you can also have your own virtual machines. That being said, as part of this lecture, let's get ORU of SSH daemons and configuration files. to make sure we can connect to remote machines. On the remote machine, there has to be a SSH daemon running. Without SSH daemon, it will not work. So in this case, if I go back to this uh, Lucid diagram, on these virtual machines, gsdemo1 and gsdemo2, there will be SSH daemon process that will be running. Without that daemon process, you will not be able to do SSH onto that machine. So it will be something like this. SHD, D stands for daemon. It will be there on all these virtual machines. Without the SSH daemon running on these virtual machines, you will not be able to connect to these virtual machines. How to get the details of those virtual machines? Further, first we need to connect to that virtual machine and run certain commands. In this case, I'm actually getting into one of the virtual machines. Let me use this command. This is the public IP for DNS. This is the username. This is the PEM file related to the key pair using which this EC2 instance is provisioned. Now you can see that I am inside the EC2 instance or virtual machine uh, which have Ubuntu operating system in it. Now the user that is used to login is nothing but Ubuntu. Ubuntu is nothing but super user in this machine. You can actually say sudo su root to switch to root user. Root is nothing but super admin as part of Linux based operating systems. Once you connected to a particular system as root, you should be able to monitor everything on the system. Also you should be able to access all the files on the system. Now to understand the daemon process that is associated with SSH, you can actually say service then sshd status. There should be a process by name sshd which might be up and running all the time. You can see that it is up and running. The status is running. You can also see few additional details with respect to sshd here. Now let me come out of this. So this is the daemon process which will be running all the time on these Ubuntu based virtual machines. Without this process being running, you will not be able to connect to this EC2 instance. Let's experiment here. In this case, once we log in as root, we can say service sshd stop. So in this case, I'm stopping the sshd process itself. Now hit enter. As I'm already connected to it, it will not impact the existing session. However, if I open another session, let me say duplicate tab. Let me get the public IPv4 DNS associated with that EC2 instance. Let me go back to the AWS console. This is the one which I'm talking about. Let me copy this. Let me go here. Let me say SSH hyphen I tilde slash downloads. Then gsdemo.pem if you are using Windows just say downloads then slash then whatever PEM file name you have. Then you can say Ubuntu. 
yet paste the public ipv4 dns here hit enter you see it is not connecting it is because the ssh process is stopped at this time let's make sure that we are actually using the same public uh, ipv4 dns you can see here and also you can see here it is just hung you can also validate whether ssh process is uh, available at this time on this machine from the pc which is nothing but my pc by using a very important command called as telnet then you have to specify the public ipv4 dns of that instance or if you are using your own servers you might have public uh, ip address you can use that public ip address Typically, SSH runs on a, a special port called as 22 and hence we can actually specify 22 here and hit enter. You can see that it is not working. It is just hung because the SSHD process is stopped at this time in this session. Now let me kill it. Let me go back to this session. Let me say service SSHD status. You can see that it is in stopped state. Now to start to come out of this, you can hit control C. You can see that you came out of it. Now you should be able to change this to start. Now SSHD is being started. You can validate by saying status again. You can see that it is up and running. Now you can actually go to the other tab. Then you can run telnet command first. You can see that instead of hanging the way it was hanging earlier, it is able to listen to port 22 using this public IP for DNS. Even though it is hung, it is actually printing this information. Now you should be able to hit control and closing square bracket. Then quit. You came out of telnet now. Now you should be able to use SSH command without any issue. You will be able to connect to that remote machine. You can see that now it is successfully connected. Keep in mind that the reason why the session is still active is because I haven't exited from here. After stopping, if I have exited from here, I will not be able to connect to the machine anymore. You might have to restart and as part of the restart, SSH process might come up. Once SSH process comes up, you should be able to connect without any issues. So make sure you don't come out of this session. In case if you accidentally come out of this session and if you are not able to connect to the machine because the SSH being down, you just have to restart your EC2 instance. Then you should be able to log in without any issue. That being said, as we have gone through the details related to the daemon process, it is also important for us to understand the location where the SSH configuration files are and also we'll review some of the important uh, properties. Let's go through the details related to SSH properties files as well as the SSH properties as part of the next lecture. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details related to ORI of SSH to interact with remote servers. After provisioning multiple EC2 instances, we have gone through details related to different modes of SSH login and also we have understood passwordless login. Also, as part of the previous lecture, we have gone through the details about SSH daemons on these remote servers. Now, it is time for us to review the properties files as well as properties associated with SSH. For any software that is installed on Linux, typically the properties files will be under slash etc location. So, in this case, we can actually say cd slash etc. Then, we can actually say ls-ltr grep ssh to get the locations related to ssh files. Under etc, you can see there is a folder called as ssh we should be able to get into that folder. Now let's say ls-ltr, you can see there are a bunch of folders and files. In this case, we have to focus on sshd underscore config to actually control the behavior of the daemon process that are running on this machine. So you can uh, review the sshd underscore config file by saying view, then sshd underscore config. Make sure not to open these files using vi if you are not comfortable. Uh, view will open this file re in read-only mode. Hence, you will not be able to make any mistakes. I will always use view to review any of the properties files unless and until I have to update those. That being said, using view, I am actually opening this shd underscore config file. Now the file is open. You can actually go through the contents of the file. Most of the entries are commented out. If you have hash at the beginning, it means it is commented out. Uh, this is not commented, which means it will be executing this as and when we try to restart or manage the SSH daemon process. If you want, you can actually review this file as well. However, it is not important to get into this file. Then you have several properties which are commented out. All those are nothing but defaults. For example, in this case, when it comes to port, it says 22. It is commented out unless or until it is uncommented and updated the default port will be used that's why when we try to validate earlier as part of the previous lecture using telnet we end up specifying 22 
it didn't work earlier when uh, sshd was stopped but when sshd is started it started working again the reason why it is working with port number 22 is because sshd is configured with 22 as the port number that being said there are other properties also you can review all these if you want you can explore and try to understand in this case if you recollect when we try to connect to this machine without uh, any keys it is not working it is just complaining saying permission denied it should have prompted uh, us for the password but it haven't prompted for the password because password lo login is disabled you can review the details as part of the uh, properties file for that i'm logging in into the virtual machine once again or ec2 instance once again now let me switch to root user now let me go to etc ssh then let me say lsf and ltr the properties file is nothing but shd underscore config now we can actually scroll down this should be an entry related to password authentication you can see the password authentication is explicitly disabled by default it is enabled if i commented this out and restart it will enable the password login but as of now they have uncommented and they have said no which means password authentication is disabled that is why when we try to connect to this machine without a private key file it is complaining we will see how to enable password login as part of the next lecture just to make sure that you understand the ways to connect to the uh, remote machines using both the modes password mode as well as password less mode that being said as we have understood the relevant properties files and also the daemon process associated with the ssh now it is time for us to enable password login just to experiment we will take care of that as part of the next lecture at this time we are going through the details about overview of ssh to interact with remote servers so far we have provisioned a couple of instances and also we have gone through the details about ssh daemons as well as properties files daemons are nothing but a background process that will be running all the time which will facilitate us to perform certain tasks in this case ssh daemons are the ones which will facilitate us to connect to those remote servers if ssh daemons or background process are down we will not be able to connect to those servers as of now the password login is disabled on these remote machines let's see how to enable password login the steps that are involved to make any changes to the ssh properties files are nothing but you can update the properties file then you have to bounce the ssh process only then the changes will be in effect otherwise the changes will not be affected it is not only with respect to ssh any process where you want to customize the behavior if we have to update the properties file most of the time we have to restart the process as well that being said now let me exit from here let me try to connect using password login where i am not specifying any pem file here however it is complaining saying permission denied you can see that i am not able to connect to this machine after making the change after bouncing the ssh daemon process when we try to run this command it should prompt for the password now let me connect to the ec2 instance or virtual machine using the private key file the private key file is nothing but jsdemo.pem now i am connected now let me go to the root account let me go to etc ssh we need to open file called as sshd_config in this case i am using vi not view because i want to make the change if you are not comfortable with vi editor you can actually use nano editor or you can also use tools like uh, notepad++ by uh, reading these via remote servers leveraging win scp there are multiple ways where you can actually use ide such as notepad++ to manipulate these files but you can actually try with nano editor if you are not comfortable with, with the vi editor in this case i am using vi editor in the worst case you will not be able to connect to this server in case if you are not able to connect to this server you just uh, terminate the instance and start a new instance and take it further that being said now i should be able to open sshd underscore config now we can actually go to the location where we have the password authentication yeah they have gone here before it have actually opened in that location however it will be somewhere in the middle of the file you just uh, go down using down arrow for the entry where we have the password authentication now we can go to the beginning of this and comment it out it should enable the password login however we need to bounce it or we can explicitly remove no and then replace it with yes i am using vi editor i have deleted using vi commands now i am saying yes now it is updated 
with VI editor, I can actually write and come out of it by saying colon x in escape mode. Now the changes are persisted. You can actually say grep, then password, then sshd underscore config to review the value related to that entry. You can see that now it is changed to yes. As it is changed to yes, we should be able to connect to this via password. However, the user should have the password as well. When it comes to Ubuntu user, there should be a password associated with it. Then only I'll be able to validate with appropriate password. However, if I exit and then exit again to come back to my Mac, and if I run this command without any PEM file, it will still complain. It is due to the fact that even though password authentication is updated as part of the properties file, SSH daemon process is not bounced. Now let me log in using the PEM file. Let me go to root account by saying sudo su root. Now let me say service then sshd restart. It will take care of restarting the uh, ssh daemon process. You can validate whether it is up and running or not by saying status. You can see that it is up and running. Now I can come out of it. Exit then exit. Now let me try running this command. It should prompt for the password. You can see that it is prompting for the password but we haven't set up any password for this user and hence will not be able to log in. It will just complain. Now we have to set the password for this user. For that I'm actually using PEM file so that I can log in without entering the password. It will use the key pair to actually connect to that instance. Once you are in the instance for whatever user you want to connect with, with the password, you have to set the password. For that you can use command called as passwd. Then Ubuntu, Ubuntu is optional. You don't need to specify Ubuntu because you are already logged in as that user. Now you can hit enter, hit enter for current password because we don't have any password. However, it is complaining. So as Ubuntu user, you will not be able to reset the password. To reset the password, you can actually say sudo then passwd Ubuntu. You are using super user permissions of Ubuntu user to reset the password. When you use sudo, it will not prompt for the existing password. It will just prompt for the new password. Now you can actually give the new password. Now I have entered the new password. You can see that it has said password updated successfully. Let me come out of it. Now let me run this without PEM file. It will prompt for the password. I have to enter the password which I have set earlier. Once the right password is entered, we are able to connect, which means I'm able to enable password login on this machine. Now let's take it as an exercise and make sure the password login is enabled even on the other server. I have demonstrated on one server. I will let you take care of it on the other server. Keep the steps in mind. First, you have to go to the system and then you have to sudo as root. Once you are logged in as root, then you have to open the appropriate properties file which is under slash etc slash ssh folder. Then you have to make sure the line which says password authentication no is replaced with password authentication yes. You have to bounce the ssh daemon process or background process and also you have to set the password for Ubuntu so that you can actually log in into that machine using Ubuntu user with appropriate password. As part of this section module, we are going through the details related to value of SSH to interact with remote servers. So far, we have provisioned two servers from AWS and also we have gone through the details related to SSH concepts such as SSH daemons or background process and also the SSH properties. Also, to make sure we understand the relevance of SSH properties files, we have enabled password login on both the instances. I have demonstrated using one instance and I have left the other instance for your exercise. That being said, one of the key features with respect to SSH is not only to connected to the remote machine but also to run the commands on the remote machine directly. For example, let's say I would like to connect to the remote machines and run hostname command to get the fully qualified name of that remote machine. One of the ways is to use the approach of SSH like this where we are actually connecting to the remote machine without password. Now I am in the remote machine. Once I am in the remote machine, I should be able to run hostname hyphen f to actually get the fully qualified uh, name of this host. In the similar manner, let's say I would like to validate whether a particular daemon process is up and running on these remote machines. Even we have to use commands such as sudo, then service, then let's say sshd status. You should be able to check the status of sshd process on the remote machine. However, you are in the remote machine already. Now, every time you have to get into the remote machine, run the command and then you have to exit from here 
to go back to your machine. Many times you have to deal with n number of servers. Instead of logging in into the remote machines, running the commands and exiting from there, you can actually run the commands remotely using SSH. Let's see how we can take care of running such commands on remote machines without logging in into the remote machines themselves. You have to still use SSH command. You can leverage this. Now you should be able to specify the command you want to run in double quotes like this. Let's say you want to run hostname hyphen F. You can say hostname hyphen F like this. It will connect you to the remote machine. Just run the hostname hyphen F, display the output and come out of that to your uh, PC or Mac. In this case, the control is back in the Mac. I don't need to say exit again to come back to the Mac. It is automatically came back to the Mac. Now, I have ran hostname hyphen F on this uh, EC2 instance or remote machine. Now, let's try to run the similar command on other EC2 instance or remote machine. You can see that I'm saying hostname hyphen F in double quotes and you can see that it have executed that command and you can see the output here. This is a different EC2 instance than this. You can also run commands such as sudo service sshd status to check if sshd process is running appropriately or not. It will just connect to that remote machine, execute that command, display the output and you can see that the control came back to the Mac or if you are using Windows, the control will come back to the Windows. This is how you should be able to run the commands on remote machines. Using this approach, you can even automate certain things to validate on remote machines on regular basis. This is a very powerful mechanism and hence make sure you are comfortable with it. Many times you might have to troubleshoot the issues. Also, you might want to see what is the free memory on the uh, servers. Also, you might want to check the storage level details. All those commands can run using SSH remotely using this approach. Let's say I would like to see how much free memory is there on both the EC2 instances that are provisioned from uh, AWS. I can say free hyphen H like this. This will give the details about this EC2 instance or virtual machine. As of now, the available memory is nothing but 60, 65 megabytes. Now I can also run the same command on other EC2 instance. The other EC2 instance is nothing but this one. So let me say free hyphen H. I should be able to see the details related to the memory for this instance. I can also improvise on top of it. For example, let's say I would like to get only the available details. For that, I can split by space and get the last column information using awk. The logic will look like this. I can say awk hyphen f, then space is the delimiter. Then I can actually say print dollar nf. nf stands for number of fields. By saying dollar nf, we'll be getting the last entry details. Now I should be able to hit enter. Let's see whether we'll be getting the details we are looking for or not. You can see the available memory. We are able to get 671 MB for it. Uh, with respect to swap also, it have given these details, which is not right, but it's okay for now. This is how you should be able to run commands on the remote servers, leveraging or using SSH. You just have to say SSH, which you typically use to connect to the remote machine. After that SSH command, you just have to give the space and in double quotes, you can actually specify the command which you want to run on the remote machine. The control will come back to your PC or Mac. It will not be in that machine and hence you don't need to type exit. Once you are comfortable with this, once you learn shell scripting, you should be able to automate the monitoring of multiple servers using this approach. The tools like Ansible and all actually are built based upon this principle only. Now, as we have gone through all the important details with respect to SSH to interact with remote servers, let's terminate the instances that are provisioned from EC2 so that the costs are kept under control. We'll also talk about how to copy the files between multiple Linux systems as part of a separate section or module. But for now, we'll just terminate the two instances which we have created to explore all the key concepts related to SSH. As part of this section module, we are going through the details related to worry of SSH to interact with remote servers. After setting up a couple of EC2 instances, we have gone through details about how to connect to those via SSH and also we have covered some of the key concepts with respect to SSH. Now I have terminated these instances in between to cut down the costs and I have recreated these. Let me go through the details about uh, connecting to these instances using Windows. On Windows, either we can use PowerShell to run SSH commands to connect to remote servers or we can also use Linux that is set up using WSL to connect to remote servers via SSH. Let's understand how to connect to remote machines from Windows using PowerShell. For that, I'm actually getting into the Windows-based system. Already as part of the downloads folder, I have gsdemo.pem using which we have created the EC2 instances. Now I should be able to say 
SSH, then downloads. I am using relative path. Downloads is there under this home directory. Then I can specify gsdemo.pem. Also, we need to add hyphen i in between. So let me say SSH hyphen i. Then let me specify the path for the pem file. Now we have to add the username. The username on EC2 instance is nothing but Ubuntu. Then we have to provide public DNS. Let me go to my browser and let me go here to get the public DNS details. Now let me go back to the uh, Windows based system. Let me paste here. Let me hit enter. You can see that I am able to connect to it without any issue. Now I can exit from this. If you want, you can also give a try uh, by connecting to the second EC2 instance. That being said, on top of this, uh, we should be able to connect from Linux uh, that is set up using WSL. For that, we have to get into WSL. As of now, we have only one WSL instance. It is nothing but this one. As we have only one, we should be able to run WSL command to start this uh, Ubuntu-based Linux system on Windows and also to get into it. We will be getting into it without any issues once it is started. Now we are in the Linux-based system on Windows that is set up using WSL. We are already in the home directory of this Windows user. However, if you look at the permissions related to gsdemo.pem under downloads, the permissions are nothing but 777. For that reason, if I say sh i, then downloads, then gsdemo.pem, then Ubuntu, at the rate, paste the public DNS, hit enter, it will fail saying permission denied bad permissions. We need to make sure the permissions are updated on this jsdemo.pem file. Instead of updating permissions on this pem file which is also accessed from Windows, I'll be copying this file into .ssh folder and I can take it further. Now let me run cd command to go to the home directory of the user in this Linux based system. Now let me say ls-altr then grep ssh. It will confirm whether .ssh folder is there or not. If you do not find .ssh folder like this, you should be able to run command called as ssh-keygen and hit enter. You just have to hit enter whenever it prompts you. Eventually, the folder will be created for you. As I have .ssh folder already, I am not running this command. Instead, I will be running cp command. I will be copying gsdemo.pem from mnt, c, then users, then itversity, then downloads, then gsdemo.pem then uh, the target folder is nothing but uh, tilde slash dot ssh which is nothing but dot ssh folder in uh, home directory. Now let me run this. The file is copied. You can validate by saying ls hyphen ltr then tilde slash dot ssh then gsdemo.pem. You can find the pem file here. Even now you will not be able to log in into the remote machine using ssh. Let's try and see why it is failing. Then we'll actually take care of fixing this. Let me say ssh hyphen i tilde slash dot ssh then gsdemo.pem. I just use tilde always so that we can run this command from anywhere. Then we have to say Ubuntu. Then public DNS of the EC2 instance, which is nothing but this one. Let me copy. Let me go here. Let me paste. Hit enter. Still it is complaining saying bad permissions because the permissions on this file is nothing but 755. It has to be either 600 or 400. I'll be changing it to 400. For that we should be able to run command called as chmod. Then 400, we should be able to specify the name of the file here. I have copied, now I have pasted. Now the permissions are changed. Now I should be able to run this command to log in into the remote EC2 instance. You can see that I am able to log in successfully. This is how you should be able to set up uh, the PEM file on your Linux based system that is set up using WSL on Windows to connect to remote machines. You can also use PowerShell to connect to remote machines via SSH. That being said, the reason why I have uh, taken care of uh, these things is because I would like to install something called as parallel SSH on uh, Ubuntu and I would like to demonstrate how we can connect to multiple instances at the same time and run commands against multiple instances at the same time. Let's go through those details as part of the subsequent lectures in the sectional module. Before getting into those details related to PSSH or parallel SSH, let's come out of this EC2 instance uh, to which we have connected from Linux that is set up using WSL on Windows. Now I I am back onto the Linux that is set up using WSL on Windows. It is time for us to explore parallel SSH or PSSH. 
As part of the section module, we are going through the details related to volume of SSH to interact with remote servers. As part of that process, so far we have provisioned multiple EC2 instances and also we have gone through some of the key concepts with respect to SSH. In this lecture, I will be going through the details related to setting up something called as PSSH or Parallel SSH. Uh, parallel SSH or PSSH will facilitate us to connect to multiple remote servers and we should be able to run commands on multiple servers at the same time. Let's go ahead and set up PSSH and we will actually see the usage of PSSH PSSH as part of the subsequent lecture. In this case, I'll be setting up PSSH on both Mac as well as Linux. If you are using Windows, you need to make sure you have Linux set up using WSL, especially Ubuntu, then you can take it further. On Mac, all you need to do is, you just have to use brew command by saying brew, then install, then you can actually say PSSH, it will take care of PSSH on your Mac. Keep in mind that you need to have homebrew set up on your Mac, then only it will work. Now let me hit enter. It will take care of installing PSSH on this machine. Uh, it will take some time. Actually, it is installed quite fast. It is actually already installed and it is up to date and hence it is ignored. Uh, if I want, I can reinstall by running brew reinstall PSSH command. When it comes to Linux based systems, we have to use apt. Let me go to the Linux that is set up on top of Windows using WSL. Uh, I'm already in the Linux based system on Windows. Now I can actually say sudo apt install PSSH. If the command fail, you have to first update, then you have to install. Update will actually take care of updating the apt lists in Linux based system. Let's see if this will succeed or not. It seems to be running fine. You can see that it is actually getting PSSH. It will prompt us to confirm. Once we confirm, it will take care of installing PSSH on this machine. Let's wait until we get the confirmation. For some reason, it didn't even ask for the confirmation. It have installed PSSH directly. When it comes to usage of PSSH commands uh, on Linux, you have to say parallel hyphen SSH. On Mac, you can say PSSH. You can try uh, running PSSH hyphen hyphen help. You can see the usage here. However, when it comes to the Linux, you have to say parallel hyphen SSH. Let me hit enter. It is actually saying uh, command not found because I haven't specified hyphen hyphen help. It is trying to run something which is not uh, valid. To actually see the usage, I have to set parallel hyphen SSH, then hyphen hyphen help, then I can hit enter. You can see the usage here. Both are actually same. You can see here. Whatever you are seeing here, you are seeing here as well. When it comes to Linux, it is parallel hyphen SSH. On Mac, it is PSSH. But rest of the syntax is same. In case on Linux, if you wanted to use PSSH rather than parallel SSH, you can create a soft link under user local bin, then you can take it further. First, let's see whether PSSH is available or not. You can see that it is not available. To create the soft link for parallel SSH, we need to get the fully qualified path for parallel SSH. For that, we should be able to run command called as which, then parallel, then hyphen SSH. You can see the fully qualified path for this program. We should be able to copy this, then say sudo ln space hyphen s, paste the fully qualified path for the parallel SSH. It is not copied. Let me copy and then let me paste. Then we should be able to say user bin PSSH or we can also say user local bin PSSH. In this case, as parallel SSH is under user bin, I am also creating PSSH under user bin itself. Now let me hit enter. Let me enter the password. Now let me say ls hyphen ltr slash user slash bin slash PSSH. You can see the soft link here. Now we should be able to say PSSH and hit enter. You can see it is actually trying to get the usage. In this case, we can actually get the usage by saying PSSH hyphen hyphen help. You can see the output here. By creating the soft link, now we made our Mac as well as Linux consistent. On Linux, now I can either use parallel hyphen SSH or PSSH to run parallel SSH commands. As PSSH or parallel SSH is set up on both Mac as well as Linux, now let's see how we can use it to issue the same command against multiple servers at the same time using PSSH which will actually take care of connecting to multiple servers in parallel and it will get the output for us. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details related to volume of SSH to interact with remote servers. In that process, we have set up multiple EC2 instances and also we have explored some of the key concepts related to SSH. After going through the concepts related to SSH, we have even gone ahead and set up parallel SSH or PSSH so that we can run commands against multiple remote servers at the same time. 
we should be able to use parallel ssh or pssh that is set up on our mac or linux to actually talk to multiple remote servers at the same time as we have already set up let's go ahead and see the uses of parallel ssh or pssh on mac you can use pssh on Linux, when we set up parallel SSH or PSSH, we get command called as parallel SSH to interact with multiple servers at the same time. We have created a soft link by name PSSH pointing to parallel SSH so that we can use either parallel SSH or PSSH command. In this case, I'll be demonstrating using PSSH. Either you can use PSSH as demonstrated once soft link is created or you can actually use parallel SSH. You just have to replace PSSH with parallel SSH and it should work without any issues on Ubuntu based Linux systems. That being said, as of now, we have two EC2 instances. We should be able to connect to either of them using this approach. Let me copy the public DNS. Then let me go back to the terminal. Now let me say ssh-i tilde slash dot ssh then gsdemo.pem Ubuntu is the username at the rate the public DNS of the first EC2 instance. You can see that I'm able to connect to the first EC2 instance. Let me exit. Now let me go back to this ssh-i command. Let me replace the public DNS with the second one. I have deleted the first public DNS. Now I should be able to specify the second public DNS as part of this ssh command. Let me hit enter. I should be able to connect to the second instance as well. Now let's see how we can actually connect to these two instances using PSSH or parallel SSH at the same time. The syntax looks like this. Let me go to the home directory. Now I can say PSSH or parallel SSH. We can specify the host names in this manner. We have to say hyphen capital H. Then we have to specify the host name using username at the rate host name. In this case, the username is nothing but Ubuntu at the rate then the hostname. Hostname is nothing but public DNS. Let me get the public DNS of the first EC2 instance. Now the public DNS of the first EC2 instance is copied. Let me paste here. We can specify the public DNS of the second instance by using hyphen H once again. Let me specify E here. Now let me go to the end of it. Let me add one more hyphen capital H. Then Ubuntu then at the rate, then we have to provide the public DNS of the second EC2 instance. Now the public DNS of the second EC2 instance is also pasted here. However, we need to make sure the PEM file is passed so that PSSH command can connect to both the remote servers. The way you can pass the PEM file is like this. In case if you have to pass the PEM file, then you can use hyphen X like this. Then in double quotes, you have to specify hyphen I, then tilde slash dot SSH, then slash, then gsdemo dot PEM. This is how you should be able to specify the PEM file name. Then you can specify the ls hyphen ltr command to list the files. Now let's hit enter. It will run successfully. You can see. However, the output is not displayed. To get the output, you can use hyphen I on top of PSSH. We need to improvise this command by saying psh space hyphen i. Let me break uh, this command into multiple lines. Make sure there are no additional characters after backward slash. Now let me specify the details of the first EC2 instance. It is nothing but this one. Let me add a backward slash here and hit enter to line break. Now let me add the details of second EC2 instance. It is nothing but this one. Let me add the line break. Now let me say hyphen x, then in double quotes hyphen i tilde slash dot ssh, then gsdemo dot pem. I have used this approach of breaking the command into multiple lines for readability purpose. Now let me line break. Now in double quotes we can say ls hyphen ltr, hit enter. It will take care of running against both the EC2 instances. However, it is complaining saying permission denied on public key. It is because there is a typo with respect to gsdemo.pem. Now let me say pssh space hyphen i once again. Let me copy paste this one. Then let me copy paste this one. Make sure there are no additional spaces after the backward slash before line breaking to the next line. Now we can say hyphen x hyphen i tilde slash dot sh then gsdemo dot pem earlier there's a typo in pem that's why it did not work now let me line break now let me say ls hyphen ltr when we ran earlier here 
as there is no hyphen i, there is no output of the command ls hyphen ltr. Now, as we have added hyphen i here, we should be able to see the output of ls hyphen ltr from both the EC2 instances. You can review the output here. Uh, on one of the servers, there are no files in home directory. That's why it is saying total zero. On another server, you, we have files. That's why we are seeing the details about the files here. You can also improvise this command by saying lsfn ltr slash tmp. You should be able to see the details from temp folder. Also, it need not be ls command. You should be able to run any command on multiple servers at the same time using pssh or parallel ssh. In this case, we are able to run lsfn ltr command on multiple EC2 instances or remote servers at the same time using parallel ssh or pssh that is set up on Ubuntu. It can also be used on top of Mac. As we have gone through the details about specifying remote server details in line with respect to PSSH command, let's also go through the details about specifying remote server details via file. We'll be going through those details as part of the next lecture. As part of this section module, we are going through the details related to all of SSH to interact with remote servers. At this time, in that process, we are going through the details about running commands on multiple servers in parallel using pssh or parallel ssh. Once we set up parallel ssh, we have created a soft link by name pssh pointing to parallel ssh so that we can use pssh as command. Also, we have gone through the details about running commands such as ls and ltr on multiple servers using parallel ssh or pssh. However, we have passed the uh, remote server details in line using hyphen capital H like this. Now let us understand how to pass the remote server details via host file or inventory file. First, let's see the usage of pssh command or parallel ssh by saying pssh hyphen hyphen help. You can see the usage here. When it comes to the host file, you can use hyphen H. As part of the host file, you need to have the username at the rate host name and also optionally port number uh, to pass the host's details. In this case, we already have the host details in this session. Let me actually copy these two lines. Now, let me say vi hosts.txt. This is the file I'm creating. Let me paste here. Now, let me remove these characters. We just have to have the host details the host details that we are supposed to have are nothing but the username and then at the rate then we need to have public dns of the remote server now we have specified the both the hosts details we should be able to save and come out of this uh, file we should be able to validate the content of the file by using cat command like this you can see both the entries now let's say pssh then hyphen hyphen help uh, we need to use hyphen h to specify the host file. Also, to connect to these remote EC2 instances, we need to specify PEM file or private key file details. For that, we should be able to use hyphen x as we have seen earlier. Now, let me say pssh, then hyphen h. The host file name is nothing but hosts.txt. Let me line break here. Now, I should be able to pass the PEM file details or private key file details using hyphen x. I need to say hyphen i, then tilde slash dot ssh then gs demo dot pem then we should be able to line break then say ls hyphen ltr hit enter it will take care of running ls hyphen ltr on both the uh, remote servers we can also use hyphen i to actually display the output uh, uh, as part of the standard out here we just have to say psh hyphen i then hyphen h hosts dot txt then line break then hyphen x then we should be able to specify the PEM file details or private key file details in this approach. Then we should be able to say ls hyphen ltr. Then hit enter to run. You can see that ls hyphen ltr is run against both the instances. You should be able to see the output from both the instances here. One of the instances doesn't have any files in the home directory. That's why we are seeing total zero here and we are not seeing any files. On the other instance, we have two files. We can see the two files here. In our case, you might not have these files in the second instance as well. You might see total zero in the second instance as well. This is how you should be able to use PSH command to connect to multiple instances at the same time and run commands against multiple instances at the same time. Make sure you are really comfortable with this. It comes handy in troubleshooting issues in production as well as UAT environments. As part of this external model, we are going through the details related to value of SSH to interact with remote servers. We have provisioned a couple of AWS instances and we have explored quite a lot of concepts related to SSH. Many times you might end up having access to remote servers via password. 
it might be better for us to enable passwordless login so that we don't need to remember the password. Instead of using password, we should always be able to connect to these remote servers without entering the password. For that, you need to make sure you have private key as well as public key generated on your source, which is nothing but your PC or Mac or Linux based system. And then you have to make sure the contents of the public are copied to authorized keys in the remote machine. Instead of uh, manually copying, there are commands that are available using SSH itself. Let's go through the details about copying the public key details into the authorized keys so that passwordless login is enabled between our source and the remote uh, servers. Uh, in this case, first you need to make sure you have private key and public key generated. I am in the Ubuntu based machine. You can also use either PowerShell or even Mac terminal to take care of this. As part of SSH, you will get a command called as SSH-keygen. You can run this command. You can uh, actually replace the existing public key and private key if uh, uh, they already exist. Let's see whether we have the public key and private key under .sh folder. I'm hitting Ctrl+C c here. Let me say ls-ltr tilde slash .sh. You can see that there are no id underscore rsa and id underscore rsa dot pub. The default uh, private key file name is nothing but id underscore rsa. The default public key file name is nothing but id underscore rsa dot pub. You can also have custom names. In this case, I'll be using default names itself. To generate private key and public key, I just have to run command called as ssh hyphen keygen. Now it is asking whether we would like to specify the key file names. In this case, we will not be specifying, which means it will use this format for our key files. ID underscore RSA will be the private key file name. Uh, ID underscore RSA dot pub will be the public key file name. Let me hit enter. If you want, you can enable passphrase as well. I'm not going to enable passphrase. Having passphrase will add additional security. In this case, I'm not going to enable passphrase. If you have passphrase, you have to enter again. After that, you just have to hit enter and you can see that public key file as well as private key file are generated. You can actually confirm by saying lsfn ltr tilde slash dot ssh. Now dot ssh folder have id underscore rsa and id underscore rsa dot pub. If you have password login to the remote machines, then you should be able to copy the uh, contents of the id underscore rsa dot pub to authorized keys on the remote machine for a given user then you should be able to connect to the remote machine using that user without entering the password uh, instead of copying manually you should be able to use a command called as sh hyphen copy hyphen id using this command you should be able to specify the username and the public DNS of the remote machine or public IP of the remote machine. In this case, public DNS of the remote machine is nothing but this one. I am using the public DNS of the first instance. Now let me paste here. Let me hit enter. It will prompt for the password because we haven't specified the uh, dsdemo.pem here and hence it is prompting for the password. I have already configured password login onto this machine. Uh, I have even reset password for the Ubuntu user. Now I have to enter that password. Provided you have password login onto the remote machine. Now the uh, public key file contents are copied to authorized keys on the remote machine. We don't need to enter password going forward. Now let me copy this command. Then paste here. I have one extra double quote at the beginning. I have to delete it. Let me delete the double quote. Now let me hit enter. I should be able to connect to remote machine without entering the password. Now let me exit from here. Let me say ssh ubuntu at the rate. Let me enter the second uh, server's public DNS or public IP. In this case, I'm using public DNS. As I haven't specified the private key file name, it is actually prompting for the password. Let me enter the password. So as of now, we have password login to this server with the Ubuntu user. Now let's see how we can enable passwordless login by just copying the public key file contents to the authorized keys. In this case, the public key contents are supposed to be coming from id underscore rsa dot pub. Instead of copying manually, we should be able to use ssh hyphen copy hyphen id. Then we should be able to specify username which is nothing but Ubuntu. Then at the rate, then paste the public DNS or public IP of that remote server. Let's hit enter. Now we need to enter the password. Now password is entered. The contents of public key file are copied to authorized keys of this remote machine. Now I should be able to copy this. Then paste here. Then hit enter. You can see that I am able to log in into this machine without entering the password. 
this is how we should be able to leverage SSH copy ID once we have private key and public key combination on the source uh, to enable passwordless login onto the remote server. Once we run SSH keygen, uh, once the private key and public key are generated, you have to copy the contents of the public key file onto the authorized keys on the remote machine for a given user. You can use SSH copy ID command for that. Make sure you are really comfortable with this very important command, which is nothing but SSH copy ID, which will make sure you have passwordless login onto the remote servers once you have private key and public key files generated on your source machine. As part of this sectional module, we have gone through the details related to overview of SSH to interact with remote servers. We have provisioned two EC2 instances, and then we have gone through all the important concepts related to SSH, including password login, passwordless login, and also how to run commands on remote servers using SSH. As we are done with the overview of SSH at this time, I would like to terminate both the instances which are created for the demo purpose. For that, I can actually go to EC2 Management Console. Let's close the other tabs. Let's click on View All Instances. It will take you to this page. Now, with respect to the name, we have JS Demo. That is the name which we have used for both the instances. Let's see if there are instances with JS Demo in it. Let me refresh this. Now, let me scroll down. You can see there are two instances with JS Demo in it. We should be able to search for JS Demo here. Now, you can see both the instances. You should be able to select all. Then, you can actually go to Instance State and then click on Terminate Instance. Uh, you can review the details here. Make sure you, you review so that you accidentally don't terminate the other important instances. You can also check the name here. Now you should be able to click on terminate. It will take care of terminating both the instances for us. This is how you should be able to terminate both the instances at once. That being said, uh, so far we have gone through all the important details related to SSH at a higher level. We have understood the daemon process associated with the SSH and also we have understood the important properties files. Also we played with the properties file by enabling the password login. Then we have gone through the details about how to run the commands on remote servers using SSH and then we have terminated these EC2 instances so that we are not unnecessarily charged.